You are listening to season 2 of the Humans of AI Stories Not Stats podcast where Devi Parikh and Dhruv Batra talk to AI researchers to try and understand who they are as people, what their life is like, what they think about, what they're insecure about, what they get excited about, questions that reveal the stories of their day-to-day lives. In this episode, Dhruv talks with Ray Mooney, who is a professor of computer science at the University of Texas Austin and leads the machine learning research group. Ray talks about how he finds joy in brainstorming ideas with his students, making an impact by doing what one loves, his fascination with the evolution of human intelligence and a lot more. For more information on the podcast and episodes, check out the Humans of AI website linked in the description and with that, let's jump right to the episode. I can tell you the whole story it's it's a bit of an adventure but you know i was without part of my house from monday all through friday but on wednesday i gave up it was 40 degrees in my house i'm in the dark freezing to death right i tried to drive out to get to a friend of mine i got stuck in the snow i turned around and came back but then they were nice enough to actually walk four miles to get me and take me back to their house so that was quite the the little adventure. But then it was so much nicer because then Wednesday I got to a fr- this friend's house, stayed there through Friday till my power came back on and then give it time to warm up. And I finally returned home Saturday. But I lost water on Monday and I don't want to start it up because I'm afraid that the pipes are burst because it, it just stopped. So I'm assuming something froze up and I don't want to have my house flood. So I've just been careful and I haven't started my water and I'm waiting for a plumber to show up tomorrow. Um, yeah, I. So again, for, after you, after we were scheduled to speak last week, and I followed the news stories, I realized that you were probably living a very, going through a very different experience right now. Yeah, believe so, me, you don't want to go through this. But it just, it's disgusting that the infrastructure here isn't made to suffer this. I mean, okay, it's an outlier, and it, you know, I've been here thirty-three years, right? A long time. It's the worst you know, winter event. I've lost power before, but always less than 24 hours. I mean, this is five, I mean, some people even maybe more, but I was pretty on the extreme on this in terms, uh, I would not, I would have been nuts if I would have stayed here all five days. I mean, I was glad that my friend talked me, because first I thought walking in the store four miles, this is crazy. It was worth it. I mean, that was so much better to do that, get it over with, and then be in a house that has water and electricity rather than live in a house without water and electricity for three more days. That would have been in turn, I don't know how long you've ever gone without electricity, but it's painful. Yeah, I think the, the most I've experienced growing up in India is maybe two or maybe just over a day, I'd say. Yeah, and but uh, in a when you grow up in a country but, where uh, that is used to having ten degrees out. Yeah, yeah, n- not that. And when you grow up in a country that is used to having power being out, there are secondary systems that people invest in, and they have uh, they are they are expecting power failure every summer. And so there are inverters yeah. and generators. You know, maybe sometime over drinks you can hear the whole story. But let's get on to what you want to do. But yeah, so just take into account that I've just been through somewhat of a week from hell. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and yeah, that was going to be my first uh, thing to you. So thank you for describing that. And like, uh, I'm, thanks for taking the time to do this. Um, uh, I, you know, basically after win- the worst was, of course, when I was trying to stay here for two days, that was a nightmare. After that, it hasn't been a bad. I mean, water, you know, you can sort of do without. So I actually had my neighbor fill up a big trash can of water and then I get a bucket and I can dip the bucket out of the trash can to fill my toilet so I can flush my toilet. So I just got, I go to my neighbors down the street to take a shower. <laughs> and I finally got a shower this morning. So I feel, I went like two days without a shower. Anyway, but it's hell. Anyway, yeah, what did you want to talk about? Okay, so uh, thank you for doing this. Welcome to Humans of AI. Uh, so what I'm, what I'm going to do, so I just want to mention, uh, this is being recorded. Uh, what I'm going to do is I have a sequence of questions for you. Um, Some are light and don't require much thought. Uh, Others may require a bit more consideration, in which case feel free to pause and take your time. Do you make a podcast out of this or what do you actually make out of this? I'm sorry, I don't remember what you said initially. Uh, There's there's a video uh, that we put out on YouTube and uh, we will also just put out an audio version as well uh, so that people can listen to it as a podcast. Um, And I was... 
And I'm, I'm generally asking the same questions to a bunch of my guests and they are non-technical in nature, uh, more to understand the person who did all of the, the research and the work. Um, if you wanna skip any questions, that's fine too. Um, but uh, overall, when in doubt, if you can err on the side of being vulnerable, transparent, authentic, that will be appreciated by the listener so that they can understand. Okay, well, all right. questions. So let's do this. Uh, I think you were about to tell me the answer to this question, but uh, what were you doing just before this call? So I was talking to uh, a postdoc of Peter Stone's who is on the job market and she's Israeli and she's interviewing at two Israeli universities. She has an offer from bar Alan already, right? Which is where Ido Gadan and Yom Goldberg are right now, I know. But she's actually interviewing at Cornell in a, and I don't know when, I forget, I don't know if she told me when. But anyway, she wanted to do a practice one-on-one -on -one, because I guess Peter likes it, their, his students to do this. But I told her it was a little bit odd because usually when I do a one-on-one -on -one with a faculty candidate, I'd seen their talk and I hadn't seen her talk. So I found it a little bit awkward, but I, you know, we tried to discuss some things. I, don't know, I could even talk about what we were talking about, but that's what I was sure, doing. <laughs> sure. Um, and it, it's nice that you're able to get back to, uh, you know, you're doing all of that uh, in the middle of- <laughs> The only days comments. I missed meetings were actually Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I, I had pretty normal days. Once I settled in my friend's house, I had pretty normal days on Thursday and Friday, actually. And then, you know, Monday again, like I said, I've had power, it's just the water is an inconvenience but it's not a, a life destroyer like yeah. using power is yeah. okay uh so my next question is uh what's your daily routine like during covid or normal <laughs> either one your validity the, the, you know most of it's spent on like most of us i assume is spent on zoom meetings right one zoom meeting after the the next, but if you want, yeah, I mean, I think like a normal faculty member, there's a different types of Zoom meetings. So there's obviously the meetings with my PhD students, which I try to meet with all my PhD students. I schedule an hour every week for each one of them. And so I did two of those this morning, you know, talking to my, oh, actually the master's students. So grad, let's say grad student meetings rather than PhD student meetings. Um, then there's class, obviously, which I, I'm now teaching Monday, Wednesday afternoon. So that we had canceled. We, all last week was canceled at UT, plus even Monday was canceled. So I'll be teaching my first class since a you know, week and a half ago, tomorrow on Wednesday. So then, uh, you know, so for undergrad, I teach, I've been, I, that was my fall class. I teach an undergraduate class on information retrieval, which I happened to create 20 years ago or something and just been continuing to teach since there's no one else to really do it here. And that's like like 50 undergrads. But this year I'm doing a grounded NLP seminar. I don't know if you happen to see this thing. I've been doing it for three years since Greg Durrett came and took over my grad NLP class. Um, and uh, so I only have 10 people in there this year. I had like 30 the first year and then like 20 last year. Anyway, I guess because it's not as novel. And um, plus if you're hiring a lot of faculty and so I have more people to compete with. So you know, that's, that's part of my time. Then, of course, there's faculty meeting stuff. So Peter Stone and I are co-chairing our faculty recruiting meeting. So suffice it to say, that causes a fair number of meetings. We're sort of done with that now because we've made all our invites and everything scheduled. So that, that job's sort of done now. And then there's reading groups, you know, where we read papers. So I have like four of those now. So there's the grounded language one, which I've been doing for more than a decade, 15 years now or whatever. We have a, a, a what, what, uh, Actually, the meeting started probably in the very early 90s called NLL, Natural Language Learning. And we read papers about applying machine learning to natural language. And that died for a little while, but then we started up. So now all the language people at UT come to that meeting, and that's every other week, and we read papers and discuss them. Yeah. I've seen all, all four of them on your webpage, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then there's, the, then now I think maybe, maybe you don't even know this part of my life, but I've been I've always been interested in connection between language and software, right? So I used to do a lot of work in semantic parsing, which sometimes I describe as automatic translation between human language and computer language, right? So I've done language to code before, but now I'm actually doing code to language stuff. We're actually learning to, I, we had an ACL paper last summer. When I say we, this is joint with a husband wife pair where she's a computational linguist in our linguistics department, Jesse Lee, and he's a software engineering 
person uh, in our ECE department, Milos Gligovic, if I'm saying his Serbian name properly. Um, they happen to be married and they also have a little three-year-old and that's the house I stayed at for the end of last week. So I got to know their three-year-old, but we, there was actually a workshop on natural language and software engineering at AAAI a couple of years ago. And they brought their baby, which was only like one at that time, obviously. And I said, this baby is a perfect example of what this workshop is trying to do. We're trying to marry software engineering to natural language processing and produce something wonderful and amazing. <laughs> Um, okay. So that, and what's the meeting I, which, oh, XAI, obviously. So we have a bi-weekly explainable AI meeting where we read papers about explainable AI. So that take, that was a bi-weekly, so that was two meetings every, every week. Um, I don't know, and those are all Zoom calls now. So that's between yeah. some mix of all of these activities sort of takes up my day. And what's the, what's the favorite part of your day? Again, it, it varies, but I, I assume you would agree with me. It's those meetings with grad students where you really brainstorm an interesting new idea, right? Where you find you've been working on this damn thing for like, maybe you've been talking to this student for a whole semester, right? And you've talked about all these different ideas and it's all jumbled up and you're not quite sure. And then all of a sudden there's this meeting where it really clicks, right? All the pieces come together. And you say, I know, I know what we want to do. What we need to do to get this damn thing to work is to do this with that and the other thing. And then suddenly it all becomes clear, right? And those, you know, that's what I think every scientist looks for is, you know, there's all this mess. I don't know if you've done much reading about creativity, but, but it's always, it's like, you know, you're just immersed in the thing, right? There's all this crap, your thoughts are very confused. And then there's that critical period where things, come together, something snaps, the light bulb goes off or whatever, and you have this more clear conception of what you're trying to do. Um, yeah. You know, that makes it all worthwhile. Yeah, I, I can sympathize and relate entirely. Yeah. Um, and what's the, what's the least favorite part of your day? Anything to do with grading. <laughs> I'm that pretty clear. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my next question is, uh, do you set an alarm in the morning? Only if I have like a nine o'clock, because I can roll out. Now, I, there's no way I can sleep past where I would miss a 10 o'clock, but I guess in rare cases I could. So I would say if I have a nine o'clock or even earlier. So we one when we were doing our faculty recruiting meetings, one of our faculty, I assume you know him, Philip Kralenbuehl, I'm never quite sure. I should ask him how the hell to pronounce his name. Um, He's in Taiwan. He actually doesn't want anyone people to know this. So yeah, this will go out now. He's going to be pissed at me because this will go out to the public. Because his wife is Taiwanese. So they have, during COVID, they decamped to Taiwan. And so of course that time is weird. So we were having those meetings at eight in the morning so that Philip could do it at God knows what time in the evening that is in Taiwan. So I definitely set an alarm for those meetings. And uh, do you hit the snooze button often? No, <laughs> I'm not much of a morning person. I used to rely on my dog. My dog now is not very good, but my previous dog, I never set an alarm because she would wake me up every morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you? There's no snooze dog on the alarm. Yeah. There's no snooze button. On the dog. <laughs> yeah. Um, are you a planner, or do you generally prefer to go with the flow, or are you a gut feeler? Well, I mean, I think that depends on what you, I, I would say I'm an extreme planner. You know, I like having everything organized. I hate when things are disorganized. And sometimes I say I can, I trace this back to going to Catholic school because I went to Catholic school for eight years as a child and it's very structured and rigorous and everything's on schedule. And, and I think that's good. I actually think all kids should go to Catholic school, <laughs> get some discipline and organization and structure. And I like that. And even when you're writing a paper, you know, I don't, I don't hate pulling all-nighters or anything like that. So I like students. It's like, get me a draft. I think you guys even said you do a schedule now, or you, I mean, you have a lot more students than I do. But, you know, it's just because once you have a lot of things going on, it just becomes chaos if you don't have structure. So I would say I like having everything planned out clearly and having structure. I mean, yeah. you know, like I said, but then within that, there's like these hour meetings, which are totally open, right? And then, then there's time for brainstorming and doing 
thing that, you know, those meetings aren't planned, but within everything else, the larger structure is. Yeah, I, I remember one time I had asked you to submit a letter of recommendation for me. And oh, I said, you, don't send me reminders. reminders yeah. It's on my to-do list. You're just wasting my time because if it's on my to-do list, it will get done because I went to Catholic school. Yep, I, that, those were your exact words, yes. <laughs> Okay. Um, do you, I, I imagine that the answer to this next question is pretty clear for me, but uh, for the sake of completeness, do you struggle with procrastination? I would say no, actually. Again, I, you know, I mean, everyone tries to put certain things off, but I like staying on the schedule and getting things done. And uh, do you struggle with time management? Well, I think any faculty member does, right? Because you're, we talked about all the things that you're juggling, right? So I think that's the big difference, particularly, you know, I'm presuming you went through this when you started out as an assistant professor. You know, I did this 33. So I've been here, actually, one more month, I would be been a professor for a third of a century. Because mm -hmm. uh, it'll be 33 years and four months. By the end of March, I think I figured this out. This I, will I, be a third of a century. Yeah, so I, I didn't... I went through I didn't know the month level breakdown, but I knew the, <laughs> I knew I knew the years. I, I prepped for the interview. So it's it's the, it'll be a third of a century in another month. But uh, I, so it's a long time since I went through that conversion. But it is it's a lot of it is is being able to context switch very quickly. And I think as you, when you start out as an assistant professor, you're not that good at that. But like after a year or two, you're a lot better at context switching, right? So a student comes in, you're like. Okay, you're working on this project. You were doing that. Yeah, the other thing. What progress have you made? Have you ran that experiment? Yes, you know. So, and then it's like, okay, next student. Boom, you know. So you get and that's something that I think you learn early as an as an, as an assistant prof. The other thing I always I give people advice to younger career people is learn how to say no to things because I think a lot of times you know junior faculty they end up committing to too many things right and it's just that you end up with too many responsibilities and then then you don't end up committing to them because like i said when i commit to something it gets done and it gets done on time and people who don't follow that drive me nuts actually um and uh and so i yeah you know, i'm very much an organized person i like to stay on the schedule and i like people who respond to email i think you're pretty good at this but, uh, maybe not sometimes but uh, davy is better than it added than i am but there are certain people like Dan Klein. I don't know if he's going to end up on the web, but you know, he really pissed me off several times. So he is on my eternal crap list because he does not respond to email in any sort of timely fashion. And he knows he is on my eternal crap list because of this. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my next question is uh, Are you competitive, Ray? Sure. Just, I don't know, extremely so. But, you know, so I think we've actually had this discussion before. I, you know, I'm not quite sure I'm comfortable with all this stuff being online, but that's okay. Uh, we had this discussion. I think vision people are much more competitive than NLP people. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. I thought, remember, we t had some discussion about this at EMNLP when it was here in Austin, because that was the first time you guys came to an NLP conference, right? Mm -hmm. You know, vision people, they have these benchmarks. You know, it's our image. Like, oh, we got to get this percentage on that, you know? I find vision people are more competitive than NLP people. NLP people are, are more like, wow, that's a cool language problem. What have you been working on? You know, and they're less, I usually call this, you know, leaderboard chasers or whatever. Now, unfortunately, deep learning has even turned NLP people into leaderboard chasers, which mm -hmm. they weren't historically as much into, right? But they caught that from you guys. It's like this disease. I actually do say deep learning is a disease and I got it from vision people, you know, and it spreads more rapidly than COVID. <laughs> so, yeah. so I, I think you know the story that my I, I was off on sabbatical at Microsoft and my student Shuba was staying in the Bay Area with her husband and I said oh take you know use this time to spend some time with the Berkeley folks that we've been working with with Trevor and his group so she spent one day a week over Trevor and this is the fall of 2014 and she caught deep learning fever dramatically during that time which, you know, unlike catching COVID, is largely a good thing. <laughs> uh, and she came back and contaminated my other students with deep learning fever. Um, and, you know, so to a large extent, it's been a good thing. But I think there are downsides of this era that we're living in. And I usually say this, you know, I lived through the AI boom period of the 80s when I was a grad student. 
And so I've been through that. I've been through all the seasons and been through winter. So one of my lines now is AI winter is coming. <laughs> not quite sure. You got to watch Game of Thrones to get the joke on that one. Yeah. Um, but AI winter is coming. Um, I don't know when exactly. And I'm actually sort of looking forward to it uh, because the, this period is just crazy, right? There's too much stuff going on. It's like the number of papers that are getting submitted are extreme. The reviewing quality has gone to crap because of that, because we don't have enough reviewers to review all these papers that are being submitted. And there, it's gotten very competitive. Like I said, everyone's chasing leaderboards and you get scooped easily. This is another thing. So, you know, my student Ashwari was working on, you know, and again, you scooped us on this. You know, not surprising. We came back from, you know, a bunch of people did. It wasn't just you guys. But, but you know, we came back from what, UNLP in Brussels. And that was the people were, it, Bird hadn't even published it, right? It would have appeared on archive like weeks before that meeting, right? And everyone at the at UNLP in Brussels is talking about Bird, 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 Bird. You know, so Ashwarya was there. She had a paper there. And she started talking to me. Hmm, what if we did this bird type thing on language and vision stuff, right? And then she started working on it when she got back. But then by the time she was starting to get something, boom, you look on archive the next day, there's like 10 papers on how to use transformers to integrate language and vision, right? And it's like, ah, crap, I knew we were going to get burned on this, right? You know, so it's like, it's so easy to get scooped too. So that, you know, it's great that we're having all these new people rush into the field. There's all this activity. There's been a lot of progress, but it doesn't lead to the most thoughtful you know, and a scientifically rigorous um, progress. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, and I agree with you. I, I don't, I can't imagine another field uh, or a justification for why there have to be 10 vision and language board papers. Uh, yeah, I can imagine the value of uh, diversity and maybe two, three, but 10, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, we all work on things that excite us and look like they're promising at any given point. So, I mean, obviously, I would never say that people don't have the freedom to work of course. on what they, they, they desire. But, but it, it's the craziness of the time we're living through that you really have to find some niches where you, because that's, that's actually terrible. And, I, you know, when I try to start in this, I said, hey, you know, you're likely to get scooped on this because this is not like rocket science. I'm sure other people are working on this. Uh, you know, cross-modal attention. And we sort of discovered that idea like 10 other groups did, right? Duh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, so, you know, we knew it was risky going into it, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I mean, again, I don't want to be too negative about all of this. I think there's a lot of benefits to the boom and the craziness we've been going through in deep learning fever, but, but uh, there's also down, there's a lot of downsides yeah. to it as well. Okay, so my next question, which uh, is related, and I promise you this question was written before, of course, I had heard your answer. Uh, my next question is, do you consider yourself a gracious or a sore loser? Well, I mean, you have some tricky questions. <laughs> something. I guess I'd like to consider gracious. Yeah, again, a part, I would say part of this is that the, 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 right now is the time of my career that I'm at, right? I'm not, you know, you know an assistant professor, you know, I, you know, we had tenure since 1994, right? So it's like, I'm not under a lot of pressure. And I'm actually, I think the next paper, a major conference paper I get accepted will be major conference paper 150. Wow. And so it's like, who cares whether I have 150 or 151, you know, major conference papers, right? So I'm sort of, a, fortunately, I guess, at a time in my career, where you know one more paper one way or the other is not such a big a big thing i mean you'd rather you know feel like what you're doing has impact right and uh, the other well, maybe i haven't asked you this but when i talk to assistant professors now i always ask them the question and you can talk to yejin Choi about this because she really appreciated it when i gave her this advice i said are you having fun right i mean is this enjoyable is this a career you know Sure, there's all the challenges of being an assistant professor or something, but is it fun? Are you really enjoying what you're doing? And, and, and so, so I think because of that, I mean, I think you become a scientist and an academic because it's a, it's a love, it's a passion. Anyone who knows me knows I recommend this book called Grit, Pas The Power of Passion and Perseverance, right? I mean, you should do what you love. I'm really a believer in that. And then, you know, then it all follows from that. I mean, you know, so don't get all caught up in this leaderboard chasing and think that it's all about publishing this many number of papers and everything else. 
do something that A, you're enjoying is really challenging you intellectually and, and, uh, and have fun, you know? And, and I think that's the best way to have impact, that you're gonna have much more impact if you do what you love rather than just trying to chase leaderboards. Yep, yeah, makes sense. And thank you for that. Um, I imagine though, in this journey of pursuit of passion that there are going to be ups and downs. Um, and so in that journey, has there been a rejection or a failure that hurt particularly bad? I mean, obviously we've all had papers rejected, you know, grant proposals rejected. I guess, you know, I've been frustrated. Re this is maybe partly driven by the timeliness is, you know, my, some of my recent papers on explainable AI have been rejected with just not very informative reviews. And partly I chalked that up. I don't know if you've seen this is that because there's not an accepted methodology. You know, we've had how many discussions of, you know, the, uh, the us or the team or the whole project had about how you evaluate explanation. What is an explanation, obviously? So it's just not, it's not like, you know, BQA or CAPTCHA or something. There's a, you know, here you use this data set, you run it, you get these results. You know, it's it's really hard to evaluate. And so I've just been frustrated with a couple of those mm. uh, rejections. You know, we had this explainable BQA model that, that we called Faithful that was, you know, trying to generate natural language and multimodal explanations. And, and it got rejected from three conferences. And then we just sent it to this black box NLP workshop. And, and that was frustrating. A couple of those papers we've sent to three conferences and couldn't get them accepted recently. And this whole, you know, explainable AI area. And that's been very frustrating to me. Mm -hmm. And the dual of that question, is there an achievement that felt or a success that felt particularly good? Sometimes I don't think you see the impact of your work when you do it. You see it much longer term. So I would say, you know, probably one of the things I'm most well known for is my older work on semantic parsing, right? And when I was doing that work, it was not a popular topic. There were very few, if anybody, working on it, right? And, you know, so there have been work on people trying to map sentences to logical form or like to database queries, but not using machine learning. And I think I can, you know, honestly say that we were the first ones to really seriously try, try to apply machine learning to learn, you know, to map questions to logical form or to learn to map, you know, questions to database queries. And just seeing the longer term impact of that, you know, so we had our first paper on that, depending on what you look at, say 96 is when this geo query data set we put together came out. But people still cite that thing, right? And now it's 24 years old or something like that. So I think that's the most pleasing to see something you did and you devoted, devoted a lot of effort to, and it didn't seem to have impact when you did it, right? And not many people were citing those papers early on or whatever, but then slowly over time, people appreciate it, right? You know, so then Luke started working on semantic parsing, and then Percy started working on semantic parsing, and then more people started to do. And now there's like, whole, there's, you know, it's not the most popular problem, right? But there's always a series of papers that every, you know, ACL venue now that talks about semantic parsing. And I think you can actually attribute that term in its current use to me, you know, and that work that I did in the mid nineties. And, you know, and so that's nice to see. So I think, I, I guess the lesson I would learn from that is when you do work, it might not have the impact that you expected at the time. And sometimes you have to be patient and just, you know, follow your gut, follow your passion, and then hopefully eventually people will appreciate it. Makes sense. What is some one thing that uh, you think you're worse at than people around you? I didn't come up with these interview questions. Things that I'm worth patience, I guess. Yeah, I'm not a very patient person. Yeah. And so you know, if things don't get done on time or something goes wrong, you can see I can get upset quite easily. Uh, so I'm not a very patient person. And uh, what do you think is your uh, Biggest strength? Biggest strength. Oh, it's fine. These are like all these interview questions. So I, I guess I would say sort of breadth of knowledge. You know, there's a lot of people, you know, say within machine learning and NLP who know a lot more about very specific things. But uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, I used to be more of a machine learning person, but I was always interested in language. And, you know, there are people who do language that use machine learning, but they're not really machine learning people. And there are people, machine learning people that dabble in language, but they're not really NLP people. And 
And I've tried this, and, and I'm, then I've gotten into new areas like vision and robotics too. And so I guess I would say, I think one of my strengths is breadth of knowledge rather than any specific narrow piece. But I've tried, you know, I've tried to cover a lot of AI. And even when I was an undergrad, I took all these cognitive science classes on linguistics, on neuropsychology, on psychology of language, on psychology. So I tried to educate myself fairly broadly about all sorts of things that I think are relevant to AI. And I think that's been very helpful to me. Um, and I think there are things you can do when you know a broader set of things rather than just being, sometimes I, I it, people, I don't know if you've heard my speech on hammer people. So, you know, Mark Twain said to the man with a hammer, all the world is a nail. And I find a lot of people, particularly more in machine learning than in language or vision, they're hammer people, right? They have their hammer. And it doesn't matter what problem you give them, they're going to say, oh, I can solve that with my hammer. Bang, 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 bang. And, and it sort of drives me nuts. I'd rather look at the problem from a broader perspective and say, hmm, what's the right? I used to give my machine learning class this speech I call the carpenter speech, which is, you know, I'm going to try to, in this machine learning class, teach you a wide variety of tools, you know? and try to give you an appreciation of what the value of these different tools are and what types of, and when you get a new problem, you know, think about what's the right tool for it and don't just say, I'm a hammer person, I'm gonna hammer all night and hammer everything. And I find so many people, particularly in machine learning, but now in these deep learning, areas, right? Deep learning is the hammer, right? It's like, okay, how do we wire up a deep network? And, you know, maybe some, now, some problems that you need to solve even today, it's better to go back and use like random forests or something for these damn things because it's gonna work better and be more efficient and everything else. It's not just about knowing one tool and hammering everything and thinking it's a nail. Look at a problem, see if it's, this is my carpenter speech, see if it's a screw, it needs a screwdriver, see if it's a bolt, it needs a wrench. Don't just say, I'm gonna hammer every damn thing I can pound. Makes so I, I like people that are more broadly educated and know a variety of things and know when to use them rather than just knowing one thing and hammering every damn thing to come up with. Um, and maybe in that spirit, um, is there a particular tool or hammer or hack that uh, makes your life just more convenient or efficient or fun? Uh, is there a particular hammer that you found that you can use over and over again? I mean, within within research. That I, I was thinking more broadly, but if you wanted to narrow it down to research, that's fine too. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, so I, I thought, uh, so I, I'm very much cross paradigm or something because I've lived through all these paradigms, right? I grew up in the logical paradigm in AI. I lived through, you know, I guess I would actually call it second generation neural nets because first generation neural nets actually literally happened before I, I was born, right? With like the development of the perceptron. Yeah. Um, and then I lived through the whole Bayesian era and the kernels and, you know, all of this stuff. And you can look at my Vita. I have papers on all of these things at various points in the time over my career. And so I'm not particularly wedded to any of these tools. I find they're all can be useful and in various circumstances, and it's useful to know about them. And I really think, um, you know, I think everyone knows that I believe in this thing. We need to synthesize these different paradigms. I thought Josh Tenenbaum gave a nice talk at ACL this last summer on this, that I think the logical paradigm, the Bayesian probabilistic paradigm, and the neural paradigm all have us something to offer us in terms of understanding, you know, how to build intelligent systems and even understanding human cognition. I think they all bring something to bear to increase our understanding of those things. And I think the future is more about how do we actually integrate all the insight from all these different paradigms to build something that actually has all of those strengths. And, you know, so the whole, there's been a fair bit of recent work. I just went to a workshop, online workshop last week on neurosymbolic, right? Is how do we actually synthesize the, the the insights of both the symbolic paradigm and the neural paradigm and it not being a competition you know one or the other it's how do we synthesize the insights that both of these provide and, you know sometimes people i did this early on and i actually one of the earliest uh, digital workshop right i gave an invited talk i talked about you know thinking fast and slow right we need to Human cognition, people are really good at, at, at more symbolic sorts of reasoning things, and they're very good at pattern recognition and this sort of thinking fast. And, and you know, humans are, have been amazingly successful, intelligent creatures on the planet because we can sort of do both of these 
and integrate them very well at times that they need to be integrated. So I think the best tool is all of them together. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> it's it's a it's a good answer, <laughs> but there are no bad answers either. Um, how do you how do you usually make uh, difficult decisions um, in personal life or professional life? Are there certain lines of thinking or mental frameworks that you use? I mean. Particularly in these days, I would just say rational scientific thought, right? I mean, I think we're living in an era where people, you know, go on gut reactions and, you know, thanks to our ex-president and, you know, let's not get into politics, you know. And uh, I, apparently uh, Herb Simon used to have this, this reaction. If two, he saw two people having an argument over something, he would say, okay, let's design an experiment that we would conduct to answer this question, right? Rather than just continually arguing and raising our voices and screaming, we say, how do we approach this rationally and scientifically? How do we design an experiment that will resolve this and, and not just have it be talk and, and hot air? And, you know, I, in, I think we're living in an era where, you know, hopefully we're returning to it a little bit more, where rationality and science is the way to solve problems. And so, I'm just a scientist to my core. And you know, I don't think we wanna get into religion, but I was raised religiously. Like I said, I went to Gabby school, but in college, I just did not find that a rational view of the world. And I became a rational scientist. And I really do believe that that's the right solution to all the world's problems is, is not religion, it's not politics, it's science and, and scientifically reasoning through problems, you know, and running experiments and collecting data and analyzing it, that's the way to make decisions and, and to solve problems. Thanks, I, I really like that suggestion that instead of arguing, can we together come up with it an experiment that will answer the question? I like that suggestion. Do you, do you have an internal monologue, Jay? Do you, do you talk to yourself? And if so, in what language? That's an odd question. I think we, again, I, and again, I haven't studied the literature on this, but yeah, I think we all do. And I think we do it in natural language, which I guess is one of my reasons why I've always been somewhat of an NLP person, because in my mind, it's hard to separate language and thought, at least in my internal monologue, it's always in natural language. And, you know, I think, you know, natural language is a lot about how people became symbolic reasoners, right? was by forming this discrete communication code that we use. And, and so I think language and reasoning are very close together uh, in a lot of ways. And, but I'm not bilingual. I had four years of Spanish in high school. I'm not a very, so I'm not uh, you know, fluent in any other language. So I've never had the experience of trying to think in another language because I've never known another language um, you know, well enough to think in it. So I think someone who truly is bilingual would be in a better position maybe than me to answer this question because I, my intern, internal dialogue has always been in English. And uh, are you a visual thinker? Do you think in pictures, motion frames? I would say not. Hmm. I would have more of a verbal reason. And uh, what do you tend to think about when you're not intentionally trying to think about something? What happens on the back burner? Yeah, and I think, you know, I think one thing that we've learned about psychology is a lot of, of, of cognition is subconscious. You don't really know. And like I said, I've done a certain amount of reading of creativity, and a lot of it is probably going on completely below your, your actual, you know, perceptual ability and conscious reflection on so, I mean, yeah, obviously there's all these classic stories in science where people suddenly, like I said, you get these light bulb phenomena and they're sometimes hard to analyze. It really wasn't some methodical process that you were going through as part of your conscious thought. It's like, there's just all this stuff that's going on beneath the surface that's subconscious and suddenly some ideas will come together there. So, you know, I, I think a lot of times you have your best ideas when you're, I mean, I, this, is, this has been demonstrated in the, in the literature on creativity you have your best ideas when you're not actively thinking about them, where it's just sort of bubbling around in your subconscious. And then, you know, 
you, you know, and I know there's these classic examples of dreams or whatever, like Kekula discovering the structure of, of the carbon ring or something, you know. And again, a lot of those you have to be very skeptical about. But uh, I think a lot of creativity does come not when you're actively thinking about it, but just absorbing all this knowledge and letting your subconscious sort of mush it. And, and then start, if you're lucky, something will come together and then that, that insight will rise to consciousness. Makes sense. Um, how do you recharge or take a break? Okay, so yeah, so hiking. I'm a, I, I love going out hiking. So. Uh, even this weekend, because, you know, the weather, the nice thing about Texas in the winter, if you don't like the weather, just wait a week. Um, so it should be beautiful this weekend. And, and I made plans with a couple of colleagues to go out hiking in the Greenbelt with my dog a couple of weekends ago, but something came up and then we had crappy weather. So yeah, I really like getting in the outdoors and, and, and hiking. And I've done that sort of thing with colleagues. There's nothing to get to know someone if you take a day long hike with somebody. Hmm. And are you happy with the number of close friends you have? So I guess we can always use more, more friends. But uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would say generally. You know, one, one thing I've had a discussion with people, I'm not sure this is necessarily a good thing, but sometimes I use this phrase that being an academic is not a job, it's a lifestyle. And Sometimes I guess I do wonder that all my friends are academics, right? Or researchers at least. I mean, I'm not academics in the sense they work for a university, but they're, they're research people. And I don't really have any circle of friends outside of, 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 of doing science. But that's what I enjoy. I like talking to scientists even when we're not talking about science because like I said, they, they're more rational thinkers. Um, and you know, I've gotten in trouble with my sister before because it's just like, okay, I can't talk to you because you're not an academic thinker. I don't want to be around people like this. I need to live in my bubble of, of you know, these scientific thinkers that, that I get along with well. So sometimes I think it's sort of sad that some people have things outside their life like sports or religion or something else where they have a circle of friends that don't relate to their job. And I don't. All my friends are, are basically academics. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I actually enjoy, you know, living in that bubble. And uh, what are you insecure about? Mm, geez, boy, I mean, you really do this deep psychological stuff on your own. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, again, I think there are times in my career where I was very insecure about, you know, your science and the impact in the job that you're doing. And like I said, it, I'm fortunate now, or I don't know if it's fortunate or unfortunate that I'm at a point in my career where it's like, okay, been there, done that. I can sort of chill a bit more and enjoy things. So I don't know if I'm insecure about anything now. I certainly was in the, in, in the past, though, about various things. I mean, I, I, I was a typical sort of workaholic assistant professor, right? And, you know, very worried about getting tenure and all that stuff. But like I said, that's all pretty far in my past at this, at this point. Hmm. Do, do you think you're a, above average, average or below average happy compared to people around you? Oh, I guess I would say average. I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm particularly elated or particularly depressed. So. Hmm. What is something surprising about you? Something that the rest of us might not guess who don't know you? Oh, I've really come up with these questions. Um, hmm. Yeah, so I, maybe maybe because we already talked about this religion thing, it's uh, I actually very interested in religion, and so I, even though I I became an atheist in college. I say I'm an atheist, I'm not an anti-theist. Um, so I think religion has actually done a lot of good things for the, for the world. And, you know, it took me a while to readjust my, you know, what really matters in life, right? It's not money, it's not, you know, fame or whatever. It's something deeper about that, that you feel like you're contributing to the human condition or something like that. So even though I'm a strong atheist and have no belief in God, one, one time I actually, Ben Kuypers and I had a debate about AI and religion a number of years ago that was really a fun meeting to talk about. 
but I'd mentioned this phrase. I said, I think the probability that God exists is 10 to the minus Google. And, and then people, there are some people arguing that, oh, well, then you're not an atheist because you don't think it's zero or something like that. And I'm going, this is not a meaningful definition of being an atheist. But yeah, so it might be surprising to some people that I actually care very deeply about religious things in general. And, you know, how do we drive our lives by deeper things rather, you know, but I don't see why we need to bring in supernatural mumbo jumbo into that mm. discussion. But I actually do care very deeply about, you know, moral issues and, and, and these sort of deeper spiritual issues about feeling like you're making a contribution rather than it being about me, um, you know, money or fame. Um, I don't know if that would be surprising to people or not. And uh, what is one thing about the world that surprises you? Mm. Um, yeah, I guess just the fact that that intelligent systems exist at all, you know, just, I mean, evolution is an amazing thing and it's produced us and, you know, it, it, it seems very improbable, but again, it, it's, it's just not of a human scale that you can conceive of the amount of time and the amount of trial and error that went into developing, you know, the human organism. Uh, but just the fact that we, you know, we exist and that, that, you know, which is why, again, I've always been excited by AI because it seems, yeah, the most surprising thing is, is that intelligent systems exist at all. Yeah. And so, you know, I've always been, have a, had a broader interest in cognitive science and not just doing AI as helping us build interesting technology that makes life easier and makes the world a better place, which of course I believe in, but also that it helps us understand this fundamental mystery, which is, you know, intelligent systems to begin with. And how can you have a physical world that supports this sort of information processing that can do these amazing things and change the world? Hmm. What do you wish your brain was better at doing? Mm -hmm. Just about anything. So one thing I always love this quote. Yeah, you know, the mathematicians have this thing that's like, you know, you have to prove your best theorem by the time you're 30 or something like that, or otherwise, you know, you're not any good. And and uh I've never been able to find this, but I've heard this apocryphal quote from Bertrand Russell, who said, when I was young, I was a mathematician because I was very sharp and, and could do this sort of very detailed technical work. And I got a little bit older. I wasn't quite as sharp at that sort of technical stuff, so I became a philosopher. And then I became even older, and I really couldn't think straight, so I became a politician. Um, so uh, I, I, I think I'm a I, I feel I'm in philosopher mode. I hope I never get to politician mode, but I do miss that ability. I don't program anymore. I've never really been a theorem prover, but you know, it is something, I think there's a trade-off as at least this has been my personal experience as I've grown in the field is I'm much better at these broader things, right? And thinking at the high level and, and ideas, but I'm not as good at really detailed, you know, I read a paper with a bunch of equations and I'm like, okay, <laughs> what the hell's the point of this thing? I don't want to read equations. I don't have the mental energy or time to understand equations. What's the major idea level abstract point in this thing that I can capture without trying to study every one of these damn equations? Because I have little mental ability or patience to understand this real low level technical stuff as much as I used to. But I do regret that. I wish I was better at that. But I don't regret the fact that I think I've gotten better to compensate for that and thinking about things at a higher level and coming up with, I think, oh, I think this is a new research direction that would be good. You know, like even just saying combining language and vision. Who was doing that 15 years ago? Almost nobody, right? You know, and, and I thought that was an, I actually thought that was an interesting direction back as a graduate student. And I think, yeah, so I think I'm better at, at high level stuff, and I, but I still wish I was better at this more low level technical details, which I used to be better. I was never, you know, the best theoretical mathematician or something. I was a pretty good programmer at one point, but now I can't even do that. Okay. Um, how do you imagine your retirement? Oh, geez, it's interesting because I've been talking to people about this. So I'm 59. 
I'm figuring I'm probably recruiting my last batch of PhD students, you know, this year or next year, because it takes five, six years to finish them up. I do plan to retire at 65 and go emeritus. So what I've been telling everybody, and now this is going to be on a public thing, I really have to do this. I, I, anyone who knows me knows I read lots of popular science books. Um, so I've always wanted to write a popular science book for the broader public. And so I want to do this about probably mainly learning and language. How can we build computer systems that you would learn human language and write a nice popular science book about that topic? So that, that's my current plan is retire at 65 and write this magnum opus on that topic. Fascinating. Looking forward to it. Um, <laughs> do you think about the future much, say on the five to 10 year scale horizon? Sure. I think we all have to think about that. So that's literally why I've made it. I, it's during this COVID period that I've made the hard decision that, yes, I am going to retire at 65. Hmm. Plus, you look at the retirement funds and it's like, I have a big nest egg to live on, right? Why, why do I, I don't need to keep doing, particularly I mentioned the thing that I really hate, which is grading, right? So, I mean, the classroom lectures and things I, I enjoyed teaching at that level, but all the administrivia around teaching and stuff, I do not find. So I'd be just as happy to stop that, mm -hmm. retire at 65 and, and, and write my book. And on a, on a significantly shorter time horizon, hopefully, uh, when do you think the world will open back up? What are your projections? Do you mean for COVID? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think we've all been delaying this, but you know, I'm still thinking now fall, I'm hoping to be back in the classroom. I don't think we're gonna have summer conferences. I think that's clear. Hmm. Right? I, so I don't think that will, most of them have officially gone virtual, but that's just a matter of time. And so I'm still hoping that by September, we'll all be vaccinated. We'll have herd immunity and we can all go back into the classroom. I wanna be back in the classroom teaching my class next fall. I think hmm. that's reasonable. I don't know if it's definite at this point, but I think it's still a reasonable assumption. But then I, I don't think, I think it's interesting to think about how the world's gonna change. I recently read Fareed Zakaria's book, Post-Pandemic World, right? Which I give like, I, I like to read a lot, but it's not my favorite of his books. But, uh, um, um, you know, how are we gonna do conferences in hybrid mode? I mean, I think we wanna go back to physical conferences, but we also wanna allow the broader participation that just having everything online has allowed for a lot of people. And, so I, I look forward to saying, how, what can we learn from this whole dreaded, dreadful experience to make? That's why I actually like the Biden uh, motto, build back better, it has nice alliteration. But I think we can all think about that is we don't want to just go back to the way things were pre-COVID. We want to say, what, can, what have we learned over the last year to make it a better world, right? What, maybe mm -hmm. we need to change coming. Maybe we don't all go into the office, you know, five days a week. Maybe we only go to in three days and, you know, we work from home and we, you know, how can we find something that's in between this horrible life we've had the last year, but maybe some things that are good about it um, and incorporate those into a post-pandemic world that, that maybe we've learned something from this experience that can actually make things better. Afterwards. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a point to life and our existence? Well, I already said I'm not a religious person. So yeah, so I, mean, I have a standard answer to this, which I, you probably haven't heard, which is I, I'm a movie person. So I love this movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Um, so I don't know if you know this movie, but you know, this guy is, oh God. I've heard the it's name. I haven't yet Never gone around to watch it, yes. It's a weird thing for me to say because it's about angels and Christmas and a lot of religious stuff. But I, I separate the message in the movie from the, 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 the supernatural religious aspects and actually derive what I think is a good, you know, sort of moral lesson from it. So this guy is thinking of, you know, everything's going bad, he's in the depression, you know, his, his, his bank is falling apart, he's, he's you know, he feels terrible and he thinks of committing suicide and this angel comes down trying to prevent him from committing suicide and he goes, oh, the world would be better if I was never born. And then the angel shows him what the world would be like if he had never been born. And he actually realized he's impacted a lot of people in very positive ways throughout his life. And that the world actually, the world that the angel shows him without him is actually a lot worse place. And so my view is no, we do, there, there's no immortality. There's no spiritual mumbo jumbo. And when I die, I'm gonna turn into a bunch of ashes and, and disappear from the universe forever. But 
hopefully I've had some positive impact on people in the way. And so you live on, not through uh, any of this other stuff. I, I do like this quote from Woody Allen, though. He said, I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality by not dying. Uh, and that might be nice, but but I actually think we do achieve immortality through our work and the impact we have on 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 other other people. And so that's you know I just hope that you know other people's lives are better because I've existed and if my that angel can show me what my life. So I call this wonderful life impact. You know, and I actually think being a professor is a great job for maximizing your wonderful life impact because you see all the people's lives you change and impact. Um, I actually love it when I have some student who just took my undergraduate course come up and say, oh, I took your undergraduate course so many years ago, and I, I really liked it. It changed my, you know, I, um, um, and so because, you know, obviously, you know, the impact that you have on like your PhD students, which is pretty immense, right? But even when just teaching a class, you can impact people's lives in, in very significant ways. So I really do think that being an academic is a great way to maximize your wonderful life impact and hopefully have you know, and you're also developing hopefully scientific ideas. All the papers you write, right? People cite that stuff. It changes the world, right? And hopefully you've contributed some ideas that, you know, together with all the other people that follow up on them actually does make the world a better place. And so post my religious phase of my life, that's how I drive my, you know, my psychology is, okay, I think I'm having pretty good impact on people's lives and developing ideas and you know, through my teaching, you know, impacting people's lives, and hopefully the world will be a better place for me having been in it. Nicely said. Like you got to watch the movie. It's a great movie. <laughs> will do. Will do. Um, pineapple on pizza. Yummy or an abomination? Well, I, I, I like the Hawaiian pizza. It's not my favorite, but it's good. <laughs> okay. Uh, this could you tell us if something made you smile today? Hmm. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I had fun talking to you. So I, you know, having all this, you know, mumbo jumbo of mine put down, you know, maybe that's useful. I, I think I've smiled during this this whole presentation. So yeah, no, so thank you for for doing this. And you know, I don't know how many people do you have that listen to this stuff anyway? Uh, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but uh, Devi, who did the first season, she was she received some really positive uh, feedback on Twitter and on Facebook. Um, and I guess, I'm not anyone who knows me. Also, I'm not a social media person, so no. I don't. I tell people the story I have now is I got burned out on social media in the 1980s. So I used to participate a lot in the Usenet AI group and the Usenet group on. Uh, origin and creation science, because I had recently become an atheist and, and I was really countered any of these ideas about creation science. And I was very active, particularly on that group. And I just got burned out on it in, when I was a graduate student in the 1980s. And so I have not done social media since, you know, being an active participant in Usenet news groups in the 80s. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, so I guess, uh... My almost last question, uh, why did you agree to do this interview with me? Well, so I mean, you know, I know you, I could hopefully, you know, you're a reasonable friend. I could trust that you wouldn't make me look bad, hopefully. <laughs> but also, you know, I, I, I do enjoy, you know, just talking to people about, you know, now that I've been being a professor for 35 years and I've had other people, like I said, I've a couple of, you know, younger people who valued the advice that I've given them in the past. And, you know, it through, you know, like I said, part of my wonderful, yeah, so it's trying to contribute to my wonderful life impact. If anything I've said here, maybe make someone say, yeah, I'm not going to chase that benchmark on that problem. I'm going to really think deeply about this really cool idea I've had and work on that instead. And, you know, Ray said, that's probably a better thing to do. So I'll do that. It's like, wow, that's great. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I am really hoping that it, that <laughs> that that impact happens, uh, and I'm sure it will. Um, so my last question is: there, those were all my questions, but is there anything that we didn't get to uh, that you think we should cover in terms of who you are and what your life has been like? Oh yeah, I don't think so. I think you've, you've covered a lot of uh, a lot of ground. I think that will do. Okay, so. Uh, We'll stop here. Those were all my questions. Thank you for doing so, this. Right? So what number am I in all this? How many people have you done it? 
between Devi and the IBM Dynamics. Uh, so Devi did uh, the first cohort or season of 18 people. Um, I'm aiming for another 18-ish right now. Um, I'm, I've invited a few people. Um, some I'm in the middle of scheduling. Uh, others I've started interviewing already. So I'll, I'll try to aim for a similar. Okay, well, well good nice. luck. And again, I hope it helps maximize your wonderful life. Uh, I impact and you know if like you said if, if if people can watch this and and you know improve their life from it then so much the better i i i'm confident uh, and thank you this was this was a wonderful conversation uh, so okay. thank you for thank you for taking okay. the time nice talking to you Drew. yeah bye Ray. Adios. <laughs>